Hello, good evening and once again, welcome to In The Now, brought to you by The Racing Post and Coral. My name is Ross Briley. We had a lovely first day at Glorious Goodwood, then it went into a, a bit of a, a December feel on the, uh, the south coast. But today was much better, still soft ground, uh, but the results made sense and the sun came out. That's for sure. We also had some thrilling finishes as well, uh, including a, a Jim Crowley masterclass, uh, this time without a, a lengthy ban. Uh, we, uh, we had a, an impressive two-year-old winner, admittedly uh, not beating a great deal, but Van Dijk looked very special indeed. And Desert Hero uh, proved that it wasn't just a, a suicidal pace uh, at Ascot. Uh, this horse is seriously talented. Doesn't get going until it's all too late, or almost all too late, but that's just what you want. Uh, for a mile and six at Doncaster when he might be headed there. So, uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, uh, Novus coming back from a, a two-day absence as well. Uh, what is this, Galway? Uh, it's, uh, it's all going on. It is all going on, and we've still got two more days uh, to go. Of course, we've got uh, one of the horses of the season last year, Highfield Princess, uh, returning to the track. and also got Nostrum trying to uh, take it up a notch uh, as well, uh, and plenty more to talk about on tomorrow's Goodwood card. So, uh, like I said, this is always uh, live and interactive. The chat box is right in front of me. Like, subscribe and all that jazz uh, and get involved uh, in the show tonight uh, as we gear up for a, another day of glorious Goodwood action. Uh, John Quinn's literally just had a winner uh, in the, uh, the final race of the other day at Goodwood. That's two sprint winners today, so it's all looking good for Highfield Princess followers tomorrow. Uh, but so We don't have a, a princess in the studio, but we do have a prince. It's, uh, it's Graham Rodway in the flesh. Yeah. How are you doing, buddy? Lovely to see you. Yeah, very well, Ross. Uh, good to be back. We've got two more days to go, haven't we? I'm losing yep. count now, because especially with Galway starting on Monday, it's one of those busy old weeks, isn't it? But, uh, yeah, still got plenty of good racing to come, and hopefully now the weather is set fair. What do you reckon? I think so. I think we, yeah, it looks we like... we passed the worst of it now? Definitely. It's going to be a bit sunny tomorrow, I think. There might be a little bit at lunchtime mm. on Saturday, but, um, I mean, there was quite a few horses today that I thought... I, quite, I thought they had a chance, but I wasn't sure they'd handle the ground. Uh, Al Husson and Mission to Moon being two of those. Yeah. Uh, and they went on one quite, quite nicely. So it, it ain't that bad, is it? Not now. It was bad on Wednesday, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was oh, bad It was yesterday, really bad. Yeah. But now they've opened up that fresh strip of ground as well on the other side of the track. You know, hopefully from now on we'll get some nice... Well, it's is Goodwood, obviously, but we'll get some nice clean racing. Yeah. Uh, what did you think of today? Uh, again, uh, just... A perfectly pitched ride uh, on on Al Husson. Stole the day uh, a, a little bit. Um, Nashua maybe came from a little bit too far back, and you can see why they dropped her back in trip. People will say Blue Rose Sam was unlucky, but you could argue the whole field were unlucky, or you could argue that the winner was just the best on the day. Yeah, I, uh, it's a shame with Blue Rose Sam, because I would have liked to have seen what she was really made of when she was let down. But to my eye, she didn't appear to be travelling that well, and... Mm. I think that if she'd been real top class, she might have got that gap anyway on the inside, but she maybe lacked that sort of instant acceleration to go and get there. Then obviously Ryan Pender in on the inside and pretty much all over then. And she won that um, uh, Chantier, of course, by kicking on quite a long way from mm. home and just going and going and going. Uh, uh, different different kind of race today. Yeah, and she did look like that sort of filly, didn't she, mm. um, today? The one that sort of takes a bit of time to get going. Once she did get clear racing, she was staying on, but not quickly enough. It was a bit of an unsatisfactory, messy race, I thought, but um, take nothing away from Crowley and Al Husson. They did the job, didn't they? They did indeed, and she just keeps on, uh, keeps on winning uh, again. Uh, I said last night that she's a bit like the... Uh, the Phillies and Mayors Paddington uh, this uh, this year, Tom. Again, Al Houston. People, well, Nashua went off too quick last time out. Well, she was in the right position today. They'll keep grabbing her and she'll keep winning. And I'll keep taking her on, Ross, because I thought it was a rubbish race. I thought it was a typical Goodwood Nightmare race. That was three seconds slower than the opening race, that. They went no gallop at all. What, what, uh, Blue Rose Sen's jockey was doing, I have absolutely no idea. I'm not one for criticising jockeys, as you know from the other day when I didn't think any of them did that much wrong in the Quickthorn race. But this time I thought, you know, you just had to sit up sides above the curve or go on. You can't sit there at Goodwood. You never can sit there at Goodwood off slow run races. That is the... Uh, I remember old Kieran Fallon used to really struggle at Goodwood because he liked being one back on the inside. Every other track in the country, that's good. Mm. In slowly run races at Goodwood, that is the nightmare box the coffin box because the front runner drops back on you they all crowd around you you can't get anywhere you can't get through it's okay if they go strong pace they go a slow pace like they did in that race as we saw from the winning time he, she had no chance absolutely none better Phillies than her would have got beaten mm. in that position because it's just good. 
Interesting, though, that I mean, Jim, Jim, Jim Crowley, obviously, he's at Hookham at Ascot and Epsom, but Goodwood, Ascot, Epsom, they're all tracks that they're not necessarily similar, similar tracks, but you just don't want to be on that inside, do you? You want to be on the heels of the leaders, traveling strongly and kick at the right point. That's Jim Crowley's um, strength, and he's won big races at all those tracks over the past 12 months or so. Absolutely spot on. He's a keep it simple merchant, isn't he, Jim Crowley? And that's, you know, in these big competitive races, I mean, you can get away with sort of trying sort of funny tactics at small small fields and, uh, and at smaller smaller tracks. But when you come to these, it's the same in jumps. You watch that uh, Galway hurdle today yeah. and Paul Townend didn't have, to, he went around one horse, I think, the whole way round, sat yeah. on the inside, saved ground, went round a couple of horses on their home turn and won. All the others are getting in each other's way. It's really difficult to win competitive races when you get hampered once, let alone twice, as, as quite a few of these horses do. So I'm a big, big fan of jockeys. I think they, in competitive races, they are the most underestimated thing. We saw it in the opening race as well. I mean, that was that for me was the most impressive horse of the day. Uh, Royal Rhyme or whatever he was called in the first race. Mm. But what a picture perfect ride yeah. he got. One by six and a half lengths. But that is how you ride Goodwood. And yeah. I thought, thought it was I thought that was a stunning performance. I really did. Yeah, which is a step forward for Clifford Lee, because he's a fantastic jockey, especially you know, at the likes of York in particular, but he has found Goodwood a little bit tricky over the, the years, and it felt like that first race was almost him going OK, I think I know exactly what to do now, and it worked out wonders for him. But um, uh, we'll get stuck into tomorrow's action. Uh, Lewis Knowles, another coral representative. Uh, uh, just how many are there in that PR department, Lewis? Because, um, I mean, the, the, the budget must be through the roof. Is what, 10, 12, 14 of you? Yeah, there's loads of us, but we've saved the best to last. You've had, you've had Dave at the start of the week. You've had John coming to the studio in the middle. And, yeah, I'm hoping now we've, uh, we've saved the best to last. Absolutely. I have to say, Chris, the, the bar isn't that high. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. How are you doing, Lewis? Did you uh, did you enjoy uh, today? Have you enjoyed Goodwood in general this week? I have, yeah, yeah, I've really enjoyed it, actually. And I've been, I've been, it's nice being at home in the dry. I've thought of, you know, Dave and the other guys, you know, the other 14 PR guys all at Goodwood, and I've been watching it from at home in the warmth. So, yeah, very happy and uh, really enjoyed it so far. Lovely stuff. Have you got anything uh, uh, price boost-wise, with six and seven, any time-sensitive ones we should get out of the, uh, the way? Yeah, let's kick off with our main boost. We're obviously talking about saving the best to last. And one of the best Highfield Princess runs tomorrow, doesn't she? So we're going to boost her to 11 to 10, from 10 to 11, uh, for the duration of the show, up to a maximum bet of £20. Thank you very much, my good man. OK, right, we'll get into Glorious Good in a second. Uh, a couple of things to mention uh, on the chat. Uh, a couple of people saying, the results made sense. What are you talking about, Ross? I mean, four, half of the races today were won by the favourite. Um, there was a couple of surprises, yeah, admittedly, but you're not looking at you're not looking 25, 33, 40 to 1 shots who had absolutely no form whatsoever. Uh, so uh, zip it on the chat, quite frankly. There you go. Uh, but uh, <laughs> get your selections. Don't zip it, actually. Get your selections here. Uh, I like you to, uh, to disagree with me. And also, a uh, shout out to, uh, to Matt Polly, who tweeted yesterday, can I get paid for tipping losers? And I said, no, but you can do it for free if you like. So uh, I said to you, if you want to send in your selections with reasoning, let's test. Let's put, let's put these guys to the test. Can you do the job of the panel? Well, Matt Polly, we're going to find out if you can. Uh, but uh, anyway, I've, I'm feeling testy, Rodders. I'm going to come on. Let's, you've got you've had punter versus uh, pro for the past uh, couple of months as well. I'm I'm wading in, mate. Yeah, yeah. Um, the punters have actually performed quite well <laughs> yeah, in that yeah, rush. So, yeah, they do you know, know, yeah. yeah they, they do know their stuff, these fellas. So maybe we don't want to put their noses too much out of joint. No, no. I think I think I'm. Yeah, I think there's there's a definite possibility I'm going to get a, a black eye from this. Yeah, but you feel like you're you're up for it. Yeah. Why not? Well, you got it. How a... many are you going to have tomorrow? Seven. Winners. Mm. Oh, seven places. Yes, it sounds like you. <laughs> yeah, seven places, all in each way accumulators. Uh, absolute thievery. Anyway, we'll get to Goodwood tomorrow uh, in a second after this. Right, Glorious Goodwood continues then uh, with uh, a, a fairly uh, strong card on the Friday, uh, starting off with uh, a race that the man to my left uh, will very much enjoy. Uh, but uh, I uh, tend to get a little bit uh, bamboozled in staying races, albeit uh, the, the one confident bet I had in a staying race this year was at Ascot, and it was calling the wind. Thought he was going to go and win. Beat by a horse going up the inside rail. Went on and won at Newcastle instead, and he 
has won this race in the past as well. He's 5-1 to one for another crack here. Uh, off top weight for Richard Hughes and Neil Callan, who could have a good couple of days with some rides that he's got. 5-1 uh, to one calling the win. Tronador, 8-1. to one. Typewriter, 8-1. to one. Agaggio, 9-1 to one with Vino Vitrix and Robert Johnson, 9-1. to 10-1 to one. Tritonic, 11-1 to one bar those. Uh, we promised you the other day uh, that if we got over 250 likes on the show uh, that Graham would do a little bit of a preview in his second tongue, which is, of course, Spanish. So, <laughs> Rodders, what do you fancy in this, uh, this opener tomorrow? Should I do my Spanish? Yeah, then? yeah, let's go for it. Okay. <laughs> Vino Victrix es mi opción en esta carrera. Este ha sido claramente el objetivo. <laughs> Is that good? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> According to Google Translate, that's about right. So apologies to anyone Spanish watching at home. But uh, the one thing I did get is that Vino Victrix is the horse. Yeah, that, I, I think that means uh, this has been Vino Victrix's objective. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, and it looks that way, doesn't it? I mean, this is a horse that first came to my attention when I first started handicapping the stayers about two years ago. He won a race at Sandy, and in which virtually every horse in it came out and won next time. And he was one of them, came out and won. And then he went off the boil a little bit. He came back last year. I think he won at this track, didn't he? It's hard to think that after that, well, you know, they must have been thinking, right, uh, the, what's the big race is to win at Goodwood. Mm. And, of course, this one comes up. And he's had two runs this season. He was absolutely awful first time out, wasn't he? And then he, he ran better last time out at Ascot. First sign of any real promise this year. We know he likes soft ground. And all he does is stay. He's quite a mm. slow sort of, a bit like, well... I don't want to say it, but he's a bit like Blue Rose Sen was today. You know, like if he gets caught in that box, he just, won't just win. Just a one, a well, one he's galloping, just got one run long kind of gallop, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's going to really suit all sort of like that um, over two and a half miles at Goodwood, isn't it? Where they go, they start like in front of the stands, go up round the loop and mm. back and all round. As long as um, you don't get too far behind, and he's nicely up the pace, kick on nice and early in the straight. I think he'd take some catching. Vino Victrix. Vino Victrix, yeah, for Huey Morrison, Tom Marquand, who went on to be. Uh, second in the Cesaro, which it looks an obvious campaign again for them, doesn't it? It does, yeah, it looks, it looks very obvious. When, after he won that race at Sandown, we were saying, oh, he could win a Melbourne Cup. Now, he's obviously not turned out to be quite that good, has he? But he's still pretty good. Yeah, that's what we say about every horse who wins a race over well, a mile and a half yeah, or further, isn't true. it? Yeah, that's true, yeah, and then the Aussies come and buy him. Yeah. And then they yeah. win for someone like Bart Cummins or whatever his name is. And they often buy the ones where you don't, you, you don't say it, and then they, someone else looks at it and goes, that'll win a Melbourne Cup yeah. because they know better than us, I guess. Yeah, of course they do. So, uh, anyway, Vino Vitrix then is nine to one. Uh, that Polly uh, agrees with you as well. So the the punter and the pro are going head to head here. Uh, not head to head. They're going with Vino Vitrix nine to one for the Huey Morrison Stable. Uh, what about you, uh, Tom Siegel? Two and a half miles for a handicap. Uh, your sort of race or not? Uh, prefer to sprint. That for sure. But they're, <laughs> they're, they're a little bit more uh, complex. That's. Uh... I like Vino Victrix too, Rodders. I just thought standout piece of form in this uh, was the Cesaro, which second. I thought if he repeated that, he'd win this without any trouble whatsoever. He had loads of these and loads of good horses in behind him that day. And he was well clear of them bar Charles Burns' thrown-in run for Oscar. So the time before that, he won, as Rodders quite rightly pointed out, uh, over the track, over two miles. We know he stays. We know he likes the ground. This sort of in the plan. So I thought he'd go well. The other one... I just I'm a sucker for for jump trainers in flat races and Tronador is fifty pounds, five oh, fifty pounds lower on the flat than he is over hurdles. He's been in very good form uh, uh, in the la last twice. The horse he beat on the flat somewhere Bellew's town maybe or somewhere last time has gone out and won by four and a half lengths at Galway since. He ran very well over hurdles last time. He's won an entry, big competitive handy, handicap at entry. He was once rated, you know, ten pounds higher over hurdles than he is now. So, if he handles the ground, and I don't think it'll be too bad tomorrow. I really don't. I think it'll be good to soft tomorrow. I, I think he'll go really well too. So they were my two. I just thought that calling the wind was the obvious one, and it was a horse of Sid Hosey's that I thought would run mm. quite well. Yeah, I was going to th throw that one to you. Yeah, Temporize, who yeah. was kind of. In the heat of the race the other day at Ascot and ran into one, a well-backed horse, very well-gambled on horse, but also a horse with proper Ascot soft ground form. They were miles clear of the third as well. And he kept trying, didn't he? He kept fighting back. He kept coming back. This will suit him, I think. He was a uh, strong stare for Mark Johnson. I'm surprised the Johnsons, uh, I don't know if the Johnsons got rid of him or he was just taken off him or whatever, but he was with Mark jo uh, Charlie Johnson. I keep calling him Mark. Charlie Braveheart. Let's call him Charlie Braveheart. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, 
uh, until recently, until a couple of runs ago. So, yeah, I thought he had a chance, temporised. And Robert Johnson is a, is a big improver too. He's a prolific winner. But I thought Vino Victrix and Tronador were the two that could blow the race apart, really. OK. Uh, Vino Victrix and Tronador. Yeah, I did, I, I did fancy temporised. Um, uh, even that, that, that Newbury form before, Fox Journey ran a cracker, obviously, earlier on. Uh, yesterday, wasn't it? I've uh, kind of lost, lost track of what day it is, really. Um, and behind Temporizer was Enoch Doom, who finished second in a really good race last night at Sandown. So, yeah, what price uh, Temporizer, Lewis? Uh, oh, good question. Um, come back to me on that one, have you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> scroll down the page, mate. Scroll down the page. But, uh, OK, I'll tell you what. Uh, tell, us what you, uh, tell us what you do know in this opener. Well, yeah, I really like Vino Victrix, and this one's been really well backed. So it was 20 to 1 yesterday when we first opened, now into 9 to 1. And I thought I'd stumbled on a nice original selection, but obviously <laughs> Tom, and, Tom and Rod does like him as well. Um, so we're either three geniuses or three idiots. So we'll let the uh, people who are watching at home decide on that. But yeah, I was just interested. They, um, I, think, I think all of his wins, he's been ridden quite patiently. And his last couple of runs, particularly last time in the Northumberland play, they went quite forward on him. So I just hope with Tom Mark one back on board, he's ridden a bit more patiently. Um, but yeah, he's been really well backed, and yeah, he'd be the one for me as well. Okay, I'm not sure we should put that question to the the viewers. I uh, think there might be a unanimous response <laughs> if you do, Ross. <laughs> it's not often uh, uh, racing fans and punters agree unanimously, but I think mm. I think it's possible with that one. Three uh, geniuses, obviously. Three geniuses, clearly. Yeah, mm. yeah, absolutely. Uh, or uh, we could be the four horsemen, I don't know. <laughs> uh, pick a horseman of the apocalypse, it's up to you. Uh, calling the win 5-1 to one then, uh, but Vino Vitrix for you? Yeah, I'm with Vino. OK, lovely stuff. Uh, and Tom? Yeah, I could drop a Vino myself, Ross, but also Tronador. Very dangerous he is. OK, well, then I'll go for uh, for Temporise and uh, and Lewis. What price was Temporise? Did you find it? Yeah, 12-1, to one. 12 to one, Ross. Thanks for giving me that. Uh, a few seconds are needed. That's all right, mate. That's all right. I'll take 12 to 1 uh, happily uh, for Sid Hosey, who's had a winner uh, over the, uh, the sticks this afternoon as well. Uh, a couple of people saying the, uh, the Highfield Princess boost isn't on the website, Lewis. Not that, that you know, you've got other stuff to do, such as this show yeah, right fi now. Fix the website, Lewis. Come on, get. <laughs> See, Ross, he's in, he's in that sort of mood. You I know? am. I'm taking names. I'm taking no prisoners. <laughs> That's it. All right, so, uh, Lewis. <laughs> Uh, get you've the, thrown uh, Matt Polly under the bus. Now you've thrown Lewis <laughs> under the bus. Put your tin hat on, my friend. Come in. <laughs> anyway, we, you sh be your turn soon, Siegel. I tell you. Uh, when you come in, when you come into this studio, oh, oh, I've got I've got two and a half years of resentment built up for you. <laughs> anyway, uh, glorious Goodwood, uh, Friday afternoon and race two on the agenda next the, the thoroughbred stakes where nostrum is odds on at eight to 13 uh, docklands at nine to two epictetus is eight to one knight 14 to one bold discovery 14s galleron 16 to one and monte silvano the 33 to one outsider of the bunch uh, for for joseph uh, o'brien 355 days off the track but had some smart form as a two-year-old uh, but the thoroughbred stakes often uh, one of those uh, races that it can be a stepping stone to it's a glory or greatness uh, or it can be an absolute nightmare uh, last year was a little bit like that of course uh, by a couple of years ago was uh, very much the uh, the former uh, and on the way they priced this up tom um people suggesting that nostrum might be on a stepping stone towards maybe i don't know a crack at the the qe2 or something at the back end of the uh, the season but I, I know it's going to dry up a little bit tomorrow, but is there a concern over the slightly softer ground for him? I don't know. A little bit. A little bit. Best form's on faster ground, for sure. I mean, he ran OK in the Dewhurst, didn't he? On would have been some giving the ground that day. I don't think that was his best form, mm. though. Uh, I'm just... I don't know. I don't know. I mean, everyone was uh, waxing lyrical. Nearly got that completely the wrong, but <laughs> there we are. I got it right in the end. Waxing lyrical about his performance at Newmarket last time. And it was it was impressive, without a doubt. But it wasn't off the charts on the figures. It was pretty good. It was definitely up good enough to win a Group 3, but it wasn't like he was going to win the Sussex Stakes anytime soon. But it was his first run for ages, and he should improve for it. So, you know, look, he's, he's, the, he's clearly the one to beat here. But I don't think it's a, an, a, it's a, it's a, it's a gimme, because I think Docklands is very good too. I thought he did exceptionally well to win the Britannia, given the given the way the race went. He won his side by a country mile. He likes soft ground. We saw that at, at Tascot the time before, and I think he's easily up to Group Three standard. Nostrum might be a Group One horse, and therefore he'll 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 bat him aside. But I don't, you know, if, if on the figures it was about a Group Two performance last time, Group Three, you know, something like that. 
if he runs to the same level, I think Dopkins will give him a race. I'm not sure he'll beat him. I think the others have got plenty to find, but uh, but I think it's between the two, and I think Nostrum will probably win, but I think Dopkins is an underrated horse who could give him a race. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Docklands is a nine to two shot. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of disagree with you a little bit there, Tom, because I've got a big note next to Epictetus, and it says drop back to a mile. Uh, every time I see this horse run, I think he's uh, it, he's not necessarily struggling over ten furlongs, but he's got a really high cruising speed. He's clearly got a lot of ability. His runs last year, I mean, second on soft ground to August Rodan uh, in, in in Group One Company at the back end over the mile, um, arguably the best piece of mile form on offer, I think, and. I think, couldn't, couldn't you beat August Rodan on soft ground, Ross? He hasn't beaten a horse on soft ground this season. Uh, yeah, but he won that What? what? But he won that day on soft ground. Well, yeah, I think he liked the ground that day. What I'm saying is I think that was a rubbish race. Holloway Boy's not done anything since, has, has he? And he would have, should have been second. August Rodan has, has been terrible on soft ground this, twice this season. On fast ground, he's been very good, I admit it. But... Uh, I yeah, don't. Think... I, I know. What you mean. Well, I mean, King of Steel was in that race as well, so he's he's. Fan of the hook. It, it's more the fact that you know that's which, the, the races he's been running in. He's been running the French Derby. He ran behind Wide Piero, behind the Foxes. They've all been good mile and a half horses potentially stepping up. And every time I see him, he's got a really high cruising speed. He doesn't get home. Um, and I yeah, think I, he's by Kingman at the end of the day as well, isn't he? So he should, you know, mile might be his trip. I just, I just thought he. He just shouldn't be this price. He just shouldn't be this price. Uh, you've got uh, uh, Docklands is clearly very progressive, Rodders, but he is a handicapper, stepping up in grade. Epictetus is stepping down in grade, stepping down in trip. I don't know. I, again, it's a price play for me. I just thought eight to one was too big. Yeah, I mean, I've given up on him. I must admit, I, I, I quite liked him at the start of the season, but I don't, I don't think that he's going forward. I could be wrong. You might be right, but um... well, he is up to for eight furlongs, and then he goes backwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, he was. I backed him actually at Royal Ascot, and uh, I mean, he, yeah, he really, really paddled up the straight. Now maybe he yeah. didn't stay, but I don't know. I just, just didn't like what I saw there. Um, uh, yeah, difficult race, isn't it? Right, Nostrum priced up on reputation, surely, isn't he? Uh, he was mm. good at Newmarket, but a lot of horses that day and at that meeting went from the front and made all. He went from the front and made all. He was clearly the best horse in the race. He looked like a Group 1 horse, but I don't think he beat anything that day. Yeah. When he, the, the one time that he's come up against real decent opposition, he was beaten when he was 5-2 to two joint favourite for the Dewhurst last year. And we know Geraldine's a good horse and Royal Scotsman are good horses, but I think they've been exposed, haven't they, this year mm. as not being... They're not up to Paddington class, are they? Um, that said, you know, if Geraldine was in here, he'd, he'd oh, be, yeah, he'd be long odds on as yeah, well. Yeah, so. of course he would be. And, you know, he's the most exciting horse in the race, but at the prices, I mean, I'd much rather back Docklands, mm. like, like Tom said. Um, I mean, so, he deserves backing just off the back, the fact that he's, they've not sold him to Hong Kong. I mean, that yeah. in and of itself is a novelty of to winning that race. They have, to, they have sold him to Australia, though. He's off to Australia, uh, well, soonish, for sure. Mm. Fair enough. I'll take, I'll take it all back then. He probably ran in the strongest race of the whole year at Wolverhampton, didn't he? Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, when he was beaten by Cicero's gift by a length and a half. Uh, I know a few people at the Hill Stable and they think Cicero's gift is a real deal. Now, I know that he was disappointing at, um, at Royal Ascot that day, but and I don't think a lot went right for him uh, for one reason or another. And, and, and they think Cicero's gift is a right old tall and that you'll see it at some point this season. He's come out and won three times since, hasn't he, Docklands? Absolutely bolted up on soft ground. Like Tom said, he, he won his side by miles. He beat all that was on the other side by mm -hmm. half a length at, at Royal Ascot. I don't think there's a, a lot between Nostrum and uh, Docklands, but yet the prices are hugely different, aren't they? So, uh, yeah, from from a price perspective, I'll be backing Docklands to beat Nostrum. OK, uh, Docklands times two. Just a quick word on uh, Galeron here, uh, Tom. I mean, again, I've got a note next to him, same thing almost, drop back to seven furlongs, but uh, this is going to be a little bit easier than very testing around Newmarket or the stiff mile at Ascot. Is there any chance that he could get involved? Yeah, yeah, he was a big eye catcher in the Irish 1,000, 2,000 guineas. Uh, stuck out the back, finished fast in a race to whether, you know, it was really hard that weekend to come anywhere, come up the outside. I thought he did really well to finish fifth that day. He was just bang disappointing in the St. James's Palace. Now, it might have been a ground thing, and he was ridden quite aggressively, which he normally isn't, James. Jimmy Mack, where now you're coming back. You can stay You can stay in Aussie, Jimmy Mack, after the ride you gave Galleron. Uh uh, 
he, he, I think he just, I think he just went too, too hard because mm. that was a, you know, Chaldean went too hard and he sort of chased him in behind. And I think probably that's a throw, throw out race. So yes, he's, he's, a, he's a decent horse, Galeron, for sure. But I, yeah, I think the top two might, you know, I'd be, listen, you'd be very disappointed if Nostrum and Docklands can't beat Galeron because we know what Galeron is. He's a very good horse, a group three horse probably, but they have potential to be a bit better than him. Okay. Plenty of opinions flying about in the thoroughbred stakes. Uh, then, uh, Lewis, uh, anything price boost to uh, to get us excited, or any strong opinions your end? Uh, yeah, we've got a price boost. We'll come on to Hamish a bit later. But Nostrum and Hamish both to win by um, over two lengths is six to one from five to one. So that's uh, yeah, you can have the two hot pots tomorrow um, in that double. Um, Knight's a horse I couldn't really get away from. I was really excited about him going into this year, and he ran a stinker, didn't he, in the green? And so he, he has got to prove he's this is trained on, but really good form last year in the Horace Hill in, um, in testing ground. And I just thought 14 to one, maybe each way, or maybe even without the favourite, um, you know, he was interesting. But yeah, echo what the guys say. I think Nostrum, probably by far the most likely winner, but I'd rather be a layer than a backer at eight to 13. Okay. Uh, well, there we go then. Nostrum, eight to 13, but we do have that price boost if you want to get involved. Uh, I'm going to take Epic Tetis to, uh, to bounce back. Dropped in trip, uh, Graham. Docklands, yeah, for me. Docklands it is. Uh, Mr. Siegel. Yeah, you're, you're, I'm warming to your epic taters from stall one. I think they'll try and make the running on him, won't they, for a change? And, you know, I think I think being on that rail is going to be a big advantage tomorrow. I mean, I'm just just sort of moving us moving aside for a bit. I thought it was a big advantage today. We especially saw that in the last race. It's going to be even bigger tomorrow when the rail comes down. I think, you know, normally we talk about this day as being the day for the low numbers. I think it's going to be accentuated even further because of the way the rain has come. When here comes when one... Uh, on the uh, Sussex, Sussex State, yeah. yeah, that that was, and the following two days, it was a ma you know, yeah. in the stewards, they all went on the far side, you know, all the, they all went to the low numbers by the end of the week. So, and I think because they cut up, chewed up all the ground in the middle, mm. it's going to be an even bigger advantage being on that rail on the far side. So, from stall one, if Frankie takes the ball by the horns, Epic Tetris could be hard to catch. I'm still going to go for Dolphins. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, well, uh, I hope he. He does sit on that rail and uh, either dictate or at least pounce uh, in Crawley style down the uh, down the home straight. So that's the, the thoroughbred stakes then for that 2.25. Uh, speaking of draws, Tom Siegel, uh, it is the biggest draw race of the, the year, potentially. Uh, certainly of the week, that's for sure. The Golden Mile, uh, and there's a Golden Highway, that's for sure, and it is in low numbers. Uh, Latam is seven to two and is drawn in box three. Six to one is Takari Bay and is drawn in box four. Eight to one is Racing Brakes Rider and is drawn uh, in box seven. Uh, blue for you uh, and uh, an Owl are ten to one. They're in double figures, but Revich is in one at ten to one. Dutch Decoy uh, is an eleven to one shot, and uh, let's see, he's in box eight as well. So uh, the majority of this field are uh, made up by uh, at the majority of the market are made up by those horses who are drawn low. We've only had three. In the past, what is it, three, 27 years, I think it is, uh, Rodders, who have, who have won from double-figure stalls. Uh, one of them was a, was Wentworth under a Richard Hughes masterclass. Mm. Uh, one was Larabe, who was buried down the rail, and suddenly everything opened up in front of him. Um, so, yeah, getting a nice position is, 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 is absolutely imperative for, the, for this race. And Latan was pulled out the other day because the ground wasn't as soft as they were expecting. They're going to be rubbing their hands together with the with the conditions oh. and the draw, aren't they? Yeah, they probably can't believe their luck, can they? That um, um, connections, he's, he, everything's come right for him, grounds come right for him, and then they've pulled stall three out of the bag, mm. um, which I think three times in a row was won from stall three earlier in the year. Tom's already kind of said the reason why the, the draw bias is so big on mm -hmm. this course. Not only is it a sharp right-handed bend where they, they start in this, this mile race, but also they bring down that, that temporary row and it opens up a whole bunch of fresh ground on the far side. And if you're not on it, you, you, it's almost impossible to win. Yeah. Uh, and those drawn really high. Like I've got an absolutely awful record. Like Those and 15 up, or, or, which is such a shame because I, th I thought Wallbound had a huge chance. Mm. Well, I mean, last year, Revich was third from 15. Mm. Ross Golin was seventh from 18. And again, we've seen Ross Golin win earlier in the week. Uh, Revich has won a couple of really good races. He joined him one this year, but he, he kind of he spoiled the wise guy combination tricast, didn't he, last year? He just put all the single figures in. <laughs> yeah, he did, yeah. But box two beat box one. 
Yeah, in fact, they still keep it simple at the end of the day. Um, and it all bends out in 19 this time. So uh, yeah, the horses that I like are all drawn wide, which is a bit of it. I like Bo Pedro, but he's out in mm. 13. So it's not really a race that I'll be punting heavily in because all the horses that I want to back are out wide, but I can't back them from those draws. Um, the one on the inside that I like is the Wizard of Eye, mm -hmm. who's got form in sort of listed and group races, hasn't he, on the all-weather. He, he goes forward. He'll be, he's coming from a stall six. He'll be right up there, mm. David Egan, I think. I went for a right old touch of him in the Thoroughbred Stakes last mm. year. I thought, I thought he was way too big on some, on the German. He'd run in the German Guineas, he'd run a really good race, and he was like 50 to one. And I thought, my, my God, he's gonna, he's gonna win this, and then got beat by the uh, the German Raider, ironically. But um, <laughs> yeah, he's been, he's another one. He's, this is a huge drop in class for him. Huge drop in class, yeah. Competed in the lock inch, didn't mm. he? Um, he was, he ran quite well, actually. Yeah. He beat in six lengths. Yeah, he won't been that far. And he ran in the uh, all-weather final day. Mm -hmm. well, then, you know, if he repeats that form, he's got a chance. Only concern with him is last time he ducked left. And when I've seen him on the all-weather, he can hang left at times. Mm -hmm. um, and if he ducks left or goes left on this sort of track going around that sharp bend, could be a bit of an issue, not only for him, but also for those on his outside, yeah. just make it even more uh, of an advantage to be drawn one to five. But on the hope that that doesn't happen, he's quite well handicapped on the best of his form. He's dropping in class. He's got a good draw and he could go forward, might not, might not be getting any trouble. The Wizard of Eye, but I mean, if all band was drawn one, I'd be saying he was one of the bets of the day. But from 19, not so much. Yeah, don't worry. There's still York and Ascot to come for him anyway, mm. so he has a, pretty much the same season every uh, every year. Um, the one I back from a low draw, uh, uh, Tom Siegel, is uh, the one from the box that won last year, Sonny Liston. Couldn't quite understand his his price. That second at Ascot was an absolute blinding run, um, and I think we can ignore being held up over 10 furlongs in the John Smith's Cup. That's for sure. I thought he had a good chance. Yeah, very much. Just a little little sort of boring bit for everyone. 70 runners ran on the round course today. Highest stall number winner, Al Husson, six. Yeah. You know, it was really, it's, it's, just, it's just a massive thing. You know, first race, mile and, mile and a quarter race, trap one beat trap two. Two-year-old maiden, trap four one. You know, Desert Hero was in two, probably didn't make any difference. You know, that it, it is a massive thing, and I think it'll be bigger tomorrow. So I literally, in this race, go to one to five, the rest forget. If they win, fine. You know, absolutely fine. I wouldn't have got them anyway. I mean, so to, I to be fair, one, one to five, Tom, you know, three of those are double figure prices. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was very, I was, I was, I was, Sonny Liston was massively on my list. Why shouldn't he be? The only thing about him is he's, when he, when he ran it, when he was second in the Hunt Cup, your man, Rafe Beckett said, the one thing about him is he's got, we've got to ride him like that. And he was dropped out last. Yeah. Now, if he's dropped out last, trap seven, eight, nine, slotted in front of him, don't they? Yeah, P you know, potentially. Just, but, I mean, the, the hope for that, though, is that Orban did that last year and got the dream run down the rail. Novus, Novus today fell out of the stalls from box one and got the dream run. Absolutely right. So, at 12 to 1, I would certainly not put you off him. Uh, Latam's a lummox. That's how I would describe him. <laughs> In the fact that he's 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 very good, but it just takes ages to wind up, and that doesn't that doesn't remind me of normal Coral Golden Mile winners. Normally, you need a bit of zip to get through gaps and you know find your space and find your spot. He can win, of course he can, but he, I just he's just not not the type of horse that normally wins it. They're normally a bit zippier than him. Mm. Though the one I liked was perfectly obvious, Taka Rib Bay. Uh, Best form at a mile, ran an absolute blinder yeah. at step up seven furlongs on Saturday. First home on his side. All the good horses were on his side. Biggles, Montesib, all the ones people yeah. fancied, and he blitzed them. Well, and Tom, I mean, there's been there's been two horses this week. Magical Sunset won her side uh, at uh, at Ascot, and Spirit yeah. of Bermuda won her side at Royal yeah. Ascot. They've both come out and won won this week as well. So it might not necessarily work out exactly next time out. Uh, but I mean, it's a similar thing, you know. Sonny Liston won his side as well. So, yeah, it, 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 yeah they've all. Takari Bay, he ran a blinder, didn't he? He ran an absolute blinder on Saturday. Uh, quick, quick turnaround, but it's been half done this race. You know, with horses with penalties have won this race in the past. And I just thought he was massively informed. Now, the question you've got against him is whether he's as good at Goodwood as he is at Ascot. He's only had one go at it. He's only beaten one and a half lengths from the widest stall. Funnily enough, he was in trap 11 one day in a very competitive handicap where Ross Gollin was in it. And it was a really, he was only beaten a length and a half. So I don't think the trap's going to be an issue for him. I just thought he had everything going for him, like soft ground, miles, no problem. 
uh, nice draw stall for you can sit sit in behind. I presume Revit will go forward. I presume the gatekeeper will go forward from five as well. So those were other ones I was interested in. And I think he's going to be tough to beat. He's, I, I just think he's got everything going from the other one. The one I was slightly interested in, he was slightly wider, was Racing Brakes Rider, the three-year-old, because he's unbeaten in soft ground by Fast Company. That We all know they love soft ground. You can forget his, his Britannia run. I don't know what they were doing on that. It might have been Jimmy Mack again. Uh, they went they went way too It was too Jimmy quick. Mack. It was Jimmy Mack indeed. Way too quickly on him. And he finished out the back. So, I don't know. I just, every year, stalls one to five. Which one do you fancy the most? Uh, Takaru Bay. I should probably have, uh, I will probably back Sunny Listener as well because of the price. Okay, there we go. Uh, yeah, uh, the golden mile then. And the, uh, the man with the... The Midas touch in terms of extra places or uh, or price boost is uh, is Lewis Knowles. Lewis, what have you got for uh, for the Coral Golden Mile? Yeah, you can have five places each way on this one. So yeah, it's good each way race, isn't it? So, yeah, five places each way on this one. And then if you do fancy Latin, uh, we've got a boost on uh, Tom Mark One's rides. So he's got six rides on the card tomorrow, and uh, you can have five to two from two to one on him riding two or more winners. He's obviously on Hamish as well, so. Good chance he'll get at least one but yeah i uh, echo everything tom said there about tackery bay he uh he blitzed his rivals on the far side didn't he ascot in the balmoral he's obviously got a good draw i think all his wins have come with soft in the going description as well so yeah he, yeah he'd do for me and latim he'd probably just get going yeah i would be taking latim on but he has been really well backed and i think he'll probably go three to one soon we've seen plenty of support for him at, even at seven to two okay yeah yeah I, I actually thought he won in spite of that newcastle track last time there was a bit of a dawdle and i thought he was I thought he was cooked, and he somehow managed to win. So he's he's obviously got a big chance, but uh, he is seven to two favourite. Uh, those on the uh, the chats, uh, diddly dee dee dee. Uh, what have we got? Oh, I thought I had. There is definitely some here. Uh, Orbine might win it next year, says Mike Boy. He'll certainly be back for another crack, won't he? Blue for you, says Duncan Evans. A couple of quid on Takarib Boy, says Mike Boy. Uh, Takarib Bay, says Mike Boy. Uh, and uh, that's just about it then for the the Golden Mile. That time seven to two favourites here. Uh, a uh, uh, fantastic little sprint on the, the card. We uh, had the King George at the weekend. Very different King George. This uh, Highfield Princess, 10 to 11. Equality, 6 to 1. Ladies Church, 10 to 1. Equilateral is 12 to 1. 14 to 1, White Lavender. Uh, and Macarova and Nymphadora. 16 to 1, Silky Wilkie. Uh, what, uh, other horses in there. Rassel comes back. Uh, it worked for uh, Nostra, uh, for uh, Novus today, of course, coming back after a few days. Kurdos is in there. Uh, and also uh, uh, Pontos is the outside uh, runner of the bunch, but uh, Highfield Princess, odds on here, ten to eleven, and on last year's form. To be fair, on this year's form, she really should be winning this, um, and everything looks in her uh, favour. Rodders, um, she's grounds absolutely fine, yards flying, and you know she could be in the right part of the track in box three as well. It's, it's I mean, she's a place spot banker at the very least, isn't she? Uh, yeah, you would say so, wouldn't you, Ross? I mean, on, on, on what we've seen of her best form, she will win, won't she? No doubt about it. But, and I think this is a bit of a big but, okay. she is a six-year-old mare who has had 34 races, something mm -hmm. like that. And she, on her last few starts, her RPRs are regressing, aren't they? 122, 119, 112. Mm -hmm. Now, it's possible you could argue that the 112 came quickly didn't it at Ascot so maybe maybe she found that race coming a bit too soon but it's quite easy to make the case that she might be past mm. her best or we might have seen the best of her and she's running against a rival who is going the other way isn't she yeah equality he's definitely on the up and for a yard who do this with sprinters all the time mm. they, they gradually you know get to four or five your magical memory for yeah. example being the, probably the most obvious one Arazio maybe at the week on Saturday as well oh they're great with sprinters aren't they the, the hill stable obviously um Cardem and yeah yeah well yeah you know good example and who won this last year yeah won this last year and, and they will have had this this in mind when Batash won it um he he won the coral charge mm. on eclipse day before coming on to win this Batash won it four times. They won it with Cardim last year. Hills has won it five times in the last six years. Uh, he's got the draw in stall one over that far side. He's gonna he's gonna go, isn't he? If if he can't stay with Highfield Princess, he'll be right with her. Mm -hmm. The only question mark for me is that he's got to give her weight, hasn't he? Um, but I think that he's going forwards as opposed to Highfield Princess. I'm not saying she's gone because yeah. it's too early to to make yeah. that assumption. And, and she's run she, well, hasn't she? And she ran to 112 last year and. 
in the same race on mm. fastest ground. I do think that six furlongs fast ground Ascot is almost like her weakest combination, I think. And then she came out and won a group one next time out. So if she was if she was three to one, we'd be making opposite argument, wouldn't we? We'd be sitting here, Ross. Oh, say, if, she's, if she's three to one, three to be... one, we'd be saying, oh well, you know, she's put in a couple of poor runs, but yeah. well, you know, she's better than these, and she'll bounce back. But if she was three to one, I'd be, I'd, you know, I'd be you'd, you'd false be glasses and moustache in every shop I could find. I think. Right. Yeah, you know, we all would be. But at the end of the day, racing and punting comes down to price, and mm -hmm. at odds on, I'm not sure I want to back all that I think might we might have seen the best of. I'd rather back the one that's going forward at a much bigger price, and I know equality is going forward. Where he's going forward quickly enough to beat all like Highfield Princess, we're going to find out, but he might be. Yeah. Uh, Tom Siegel, which side of the, the fence uh, are you on with the, the Highfield Princess argument? Again, you were, you got on her side of her uh, last year quite early, and she, she did you proud. Yeah, well, she's another one for the wrong side theory, isn't she, Ross? Because she, I thought she ran as well as she'd ever done last time. I know the figures don't say it, but she was in stall 16 and trap 2 beat trap 3 in the Golden Princess Jubilee of whatever it's called these <laughs> days. Uh, and uh, and I think, she, you know, I, I thought she was disappointing the first day on the, in the King's Stand. The four might say she was better, but I thought that was that was well below par. You know, she having Anaf right close up and being beaten by Bradsell. I didn't think that was her best form. I thought she ran perfectly well the following day the, uh, on the Sussex. I didn't fancy her at all. The one thing I'd say about her is that I think she'll likely give in the ground. And I'm worried about equality on the track. I think he's run twice at Goodwood and he's been lapped both times. Now, he did run well at, Asp, uh, at Epsom, which makes you think. But he was still only third getting weight from horses like Mountain Peak, you know, who were drawn in the same place. So I'm not I think he's, I think he's better where they sort of where he can finish off strongly. Now, he can finish. Up. I just wonder whether he'll be, you know, on, on his head a bit going down the hill. I'm not sure he loves it. I'm really not. So I'm a Highfield Princess fan by uh, sort of default, really, because I don't think the draw, I think I think being on that far side will be a big thing. I think it's between the two. Can't see anything else getting involved. And if equality doesn't like the track, I think she'll win easily. I think she'll win by distance, uh, uh, by three or four lengths. But he is, a, he is, as Rod has said, he is on the upgrade and he was very good at stand down. If he can transform that, that form to this track, which is a worry for me, uh, he'd give her a race, but as um, I, I think she'll win tomorrow simply because of the fact that the ground's in her favour, and she will she'll she'll be up and gone before he really knows what's going on. Okay, uh, the only one I thought could outrun the odds was Nymphadora, who was fourth in the uh, the Molko in 2021, career best last time out. Andrew Balding, soft ground, Philly, really informed, proper soft ground sprinting pedigree. Uh, she's 14 to one, but I could see her. Uh, she's actually. On, on that York run last time, she's got the pace to lie up with Highfield Princess. Um, so uh, she's drawn in there as a one, two, three, a quality Highfield Princess and Infodora. So um, yeah, Highfield Princess. So odds on. A um, couple of people saying the price boost still isn't there, Lewis. I know it's not your fault, but you might mention it again <laughs> here. And if you're going to mention it again, it better be on that website. It is on. It is on. I've just been on my phone 30 seconds ago. It, I, I, it is on. I've seen it with my own eyes. So. Lovely. Lovely still. I say the, the rascals on the chat want to look a bit harder. And uh, yeah. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> fair they should be able to find it. Um, but yeah, 11 to 10, I think would be a very, uh, very fair price, isn't it? Uh, I, I agree with what Rod has said. She's probably been a couple of pounds below her best, hasn't she, so far this year? But even a couple of pounds below her best should probably be good enough to win this. So yeah, I, I think around the 10 to 11, even money mark, she's, uh, she's a good bet. And if people were looking for an each way, I think Silky Wilkie is uh, pretty solid. He's versatile ground-wise, and he always gives us running. So yeah, around the 16 to 1 mark, I thought he was an interesting one each way. Okay, Silky Wilkie, yeah, 16 to 1 shot. He was in that race with Nymphadora last time out. So um, I hope Hyper Princess wins uh, because she's such a superstar. Uh, but I do think Nymphadora is overpriced at 14s. Uh, Rodders? Yeah, I'm going to stick with equality, yeah. Okay, that's good. Hope that uh, Highfield Princess doesn't prove too quick for him. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Tom? Yeah, she's a massive favourite of mine. Kinross won this week. Uh, Pile Driver didn't win this week, but I'm hoping. Uh, she does it as well, so to make two out of three for me. So I'm, I'm a I'm a massive fan of hers. Hope she wins. Two out of three ain't bad, Tom. That's what they say. That's it. Uh, That's Lewis, you're going Silky Wilkie. Yeah, I go with Silky Wilkie each way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Hugh has lost his mind on the chat, uh, <laughs> apparently, uh, but he does think Highfield Princess is uh, is a certainty. Uh, the 25 messages he's saying certainly suggests that anyway. Uh, Stevens 99 doesn't like that Sandown Group 3 that Equality uh, won. Uh, Music Mike, Quinn Sprinters 
on fire. They certainly are. And uh, we're uh, going to move on to the, uh, at the glorious stakes. A mile and a half the distance here. Group three and another odds on shot in the shape of Hamish at 8 to 11. Mimikyu is 9 to 2. Candleford, 11 to 2. Uh, Tomesius Fox is 14s. Hard one to please is 16s. Uh, Epic Poet 16s, Jack Darcy at 22 to 1. And a, a quick swerve of the King George at the, at the weekend for, uh, for Hamish uh, in uh, a preference for going for this race, which is significantly easier, that is for sure. And uh, the, uh, the Haggis team might well be rewarded. But they've had a frustrating week um, with a lot of short price horses here, uh, Tom. And um, it's just the price again, isn't it? 8 to 11 with, uh, with Hamish. And, the one thing I thought of that York race is I didn't, I didn't watch him win at York and think, drop him back to a mile and a half on a speedier track, that's for sure. Ah, uh, look, it's just a not, not a great race, is it? I mean, I, I, you're talking about the Haggises. I think the one they would have wanted to get home got home, didn't it, Desert Hero? So I don't. Mm. I think they'll be going home with smiles on their faces, whatever. You know, whatever happens. But I don't know. It's not a great race, is it? I can't see Candleford like in the ground. He's an Ascot horse, for sure. I don't know what Graham's Norwegian is like. Is I know his Spanish is rubbish, but he's going to tell me about the Norwegian. Uh, I don't think that's got a chance. Epic poet, no. Jack Darcy doesn't look good enough. Tamusius Fox is a good improving horse, but he's not in Hamish's class. So it's between him and Mimiku. And Mimiku's been really, really, I don't know. I don't I think she's got temperament issues myself. So provided it, well, look, the ground won't be, won't be quick, he'll be fine for him. I think he'll win. Simple as. Okay. Yeah, I'm, 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 I kind of, I want to take him on. And there's quite a few I thought might beat him. I mean, the one thing to know, having been to Norway on holiday earlier on this year, uh, well, is you don't need to know any Norwegian because uh, they all speak fantastic English. So uh, Very don't helpful. worry about that. Mm. Uh, but um, yeah, it's a shame because we were looking forward to Graham doing tomorrow's show in Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's yeah. Uh, you could do a yeah. I, I, uh, yeah, change my mind actually. Yeah, you need to learn some new Anika, Norwegian. And he can buy Hansen. Yeah, that's yeah. a bit easier though than uh, yeah, Spanish. Cool. Anyway, uh, what did you uh, make of this? Hamish, yeah or no? Uh, yeah, um, in danger of breaking my own rules here because horses that just win tend to just keep winning, don't they? But um, I'm just not sure about him over this trip around Goodwood. Bit like you, um, he's kind of travels well. He sort of just grinds on at one pace, doesn't mm -hmm. he? Uh, yeah, um, I thought it was worth backing Mimic you against him. She was really good when she won at Doncaster last year on softish ground. She won the Park Hill, I think it was. And then uh, she came out and was just beaten by River of Stars, the nose. Don't think she was probably fully wound up that day. I think she, she was fairly easy to back. She got beat, didn't she, last time at Haydock when I thought she'd win. But she was incredibly easy to back that day mm. as well, I think. Um, I think she went in short and, and then she drifted from memory. And they left off the headgear, I think. They did, yeah. They yeah. took the hood off and they put the cheap pieces on today. That's right. She, Back on soft ground, of course, as well. She took off in a hood, didn't she? Now, yeah. her um, sister or half-sister, one of those was Journey. Um, yeah. who was proper uh, soft ground horse. Yeah, proper soft ground horse. And Journey took off when they put headgear on her. I think they put a hood on Journey and she won a bunch of races. And now they're fiddling around with the headgear on this thing, Mimic you to put taking the hood off and put the cheap pieces on, having left off last time the headgear totally. So they obviously think that maybe she's a bit like Journey and you know they're trying to work her out. Mm. I think she's very talented if she turns up on her best form, particularly on soft ground. Um, and she's getting weight, isn't she, from Hamish. Obviously not only the fillies is allowance, but also the, um, I think he's got a penalty, is he, for one of his wins, I think. So again, just purely at the prices, um, I would have to take a chance on Mimic U. Was he on your short list of ones that could beat Hamish Ross? Well, again, I mean, she, she is, Sorry, she's, she. she's very talented at the ground. I think the ground is a big thing for her. I just kind of thought they all had a little bit of a chance of beating him. Um, well, even the Norwegian? Even what, sorry? Even the Norwegian? Well, to be fair, I left Jack Darcy the Norwegian out, but I thought Tamesius Fox, two furlongs from home at York, last time I was still on the bridle and just didn't get home. He raced a bit too keenly. Epic Poet's got some good form last year over 10, and he might improve for a step up. And the one for me was Candleford. If, if Hamish is such a certainty, why is Haggis running yeah, but he need, He's a funny horse, isn't he? Like, he, he, is. he needs, you know, you say this about love horse, he needs everything to, to fall right. He needs, him to, he needs a proper gallop yeah, up front, and I mean, he needs to come home, home late. Will, I mean, he's he not necessarily it? guaranteed to get that, but... I just, there's just a little, he, he I mean, travelled like the best horse. He got beat by Hamish in the Cumberland Lodge last year. He travelled like the best horse and he just got going a little bit too late. And well, I was a Goodwood last time when he got beaten by Peripatetic or whatever it was called. I mean, yeah. he was by far the best horse in that race, I thought. 
but it, you know, he, he ended up out the back, and then yeah. Peripatetic got the f first run, and it was tactical, and he just can't win under those sorts of circumstances. I, who knows? I mean, the times that I've sat here, Ross, and said, oh, this is a small field, could be a tactical yeah. race, <laughs> yeah. and then something bombs off in front, and you're like, well, where's that just come out of nowhere? That's why yeah. I, I try not to, to predict. Like, you see all these people trying to be clever, oh, well, this is Pace how the maps. race is going to run, and, you know, this one front runs. Snaps. You know, it's yeah, pace maps and all that nonsense, and then so and then some jockey decides to do something completely different, and it all turns out uh, in a way that you don't think. So I try not to get too heavily involved in that sort of analysis because nine times out of ten, one of the jockeys decides that you're going to look like an idiot. Mm. Um, well, I mean, almost today a bit like you know there was Blue Rose. You thought Blue Rose Sen and. Um, I've completely forgot the the, the, the O'Brien also finished second. <laughs> yeah, above the curve. Above yeah. the curve, that's what I was going to yeah. go for. Yeah, it, there was a possibility early on. People saying, "Are these going to take each other on?" Mm. Blue SN set off, and they went an absolute yeah crawl. And, and so it happens a lot. It does. Um, so I don't want to sit here and say that entirely that Candleford's not going to get the race run to suit because it might happen, um, but I don't think he's going to get the race run to suit. No. I just thought, given how keen Tamisius Fox was last time out, that that one could be the it, one who it just could goes. happen, couldn't he? You think that Ryan Moore could be the jockey who goes right? I'm going to blast all those stupid pace match people out of the way, and I'm going to go and show them out. Yeah, maybe. Could yeah. be. Could be. Yeah. So, epic poet Jack Darcy, they were both a little bit keen as well on the last couple of starts. Who knows? I just thought Hamish was too short, Lewis. But uh, uh, Tom thinks I've, I've gone mad. Uh, Rod has uh, gone mad. I just think. I just think. Listen, what? I, I just think it's a, a nothing race. It, I'd be staggered if your candle would won. He's surely a synthetic freak, isn't he? Ascot and all weather. Everywhere else, he's a lummox of the first highest order. But give him a get him at Ascot. Ross. This was at Ascot. I'd have my biggest bet ever on him at eleven to two. It's not, unfortunately. Yeah. No, fair enough. Fair enough. He will. Yeah, he'll lumber on into third, and uh, and I'll go out the place pot. That's what's going to happen, isn't it, Lewis? Probably, probably. But no, I, I think Hamish just wins this. I think he's clear on ratings, ultra consistent, uh, no problem with the ground. Yeah, I, I know 8 to 11 is short enough for some people, but uh, I think he could be shorter. And I think 8 to 11 is actually probably a fair price on the, on, uh, on the form. And yeah, even if you want to take him on, I think all the others have got quite big question marks to answer and probably aren't anywhere near as good as him. So yeah, Hamish for me. Okay, Hamish it is then, at 8 to 11. Uh, and uh, yeah... If we, uh, if we get over 300 likes on tonight's show, uh, Tom Siegel has promised not only will he come into the studio, uh, but he'll be wearing a, uh, a kilt and a sporran in honour of Hamish, and he'll, uh, he'll be practising his Norwegian as well. So we just need over 300 likes on Tom Siegel. Not 300, Ross. You're putting words in my mouth now, my friend. <laughs> well, we didn't get 1,000. 1,000 is too much. It's, uh, again, I, I, I didn't have time to set up all those accounts. I will come into the studio to meet you one day, Ross. I promise. <laughs> Good, I'm glad. Uh, the, uh, the glorious place that Hamish is 8 to 11 favourite for that. Two more races on tomorrow's glorious Goodwood cart. And we have a six furlong uh, nursery, the penultimate race, uh, where Starlust is 9 to 2 favourite. Load of gun, 11 to 2. Specific times is 7 to 1. Flag of St George, 8 to 1. Swordplay, 8 to 1. Uh, Seri Drank, 17 to 2. Core Glory, 9s. Uh, more and lower uh, is 11 to 1. And it is bigger prices the rest. Uh, the, uh, the market has been pretty positive about Starlust here, uh, Tom Siegel, uh, for Rafe Beckett and uh, Connor Planners, who could have a good day tomorrow. Uh, loaded gun, I thought was a, maybe a bit flattered by that Chester win last time out. There's there's a lot of horses in here with good form. I mean, you know, I was looking at Whoop Whoop and Gaiden and thinking those two were a little bit well handicapped on some of their novice form. So this looks open. Yeah, and I like a nice low draw, Ross, uh, tomorrow. So I'm I'm on the flag of St George by US Navy flag. Now Sue Magnus, she does a lot of good work with her navy. Paddington, for example, but I don't think US Navy flag was her best work. <laughs> I don't know what anyone else thinks, but that's not my favourite name for a horse ever. But he he was the sire of Mission to Moon, mm. who won today easily on soft ground. He's also the sire of Flag of St. George. And I thought he's been, he's been, is it he or she's been steadily progressive. It is a he, week. yeah. It, he, yeah, on every run. And uh, I thought, stall two on that far side. Jane Chapelheim, I thought her international angel ran a cracker on ground that was too soft earlier in the week. I could see him being my one, but it's obviously not a not a race I would have delved in too much detail into. But I just wanted a low draw. I wanted to be up that far side and from stall two with the pedigree. Flag of St. George will do for me. Okie doke. 
uh, flag of St. George it is. Uh, like I said, I've had a nibble on a couple. One's Whoop Whoop, who I think uh, six furlongs is, is spot on for him. They've been trying to work him out, but he looks like he's got a soft ground pedigree as well. And Gaydon, who was 3-1 to one favourite to beat Relief Rally on uh, on debut this year. 88 here in a, in a handicap. Yeah, I, I started at this looking at this race thinking, well, I want to back one of Richard Hannon's here because Hannon, obviously, juveniles at Goodwood is, is a bit of a thing, isn't mm -hmm. it, Ross? And he won this race. I can't remember how many years ago, but it was a, a while ago. Uh, he had the second last year, I think, and the third the year before, and the third the year before that. So even though he hasn't won it recently, he has had all his run well. He has, yeah. He's got two in it, and I started looking at his first one, D Dapper Valley, which uh, was good first time out and then seems to have completely lost the plot. Disappointing last time out at Ascot. And then I looked at his other one, Gaydon, and yeah, I thought that first time out form stood out like a sore thumb. Second to relief rally mm. um, on soft ground at Windsor. Been beaten a couple of times since, but we're back on soft ground, aren't we? And I thought that uh, if he reproduced his Windsor run, he, there was no way he could be the price he was. So... Um, I came down on Gaiden. He's drawn in stall six, so he's not too far away from old uh, Flag of St George, is he? Mm. Yeah, I thought the, the Windsor form, the, the mm. York form, Persian Dreamer was fourth. You know, that w winning group company. At that was a, the Got to Love a Grey race, wasn't it? It um, was. You yeah. know, can be quite a good race. I don't know if it was as strong as it often is this year, but it can be a good race that York one, can't it? Yeah. Um, list, isn't it? It's the first list race. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it was a good effort from her. Mm. She was back today as well. Uh, it wasn't far behind. So, yeah, she's definitely... It's definitely on the list, Gaten. OK. Uh, Lewis, what have you got for us in the nursery? Yeah, I agree with you, Ross, which is quite dangerous, isn't it? But uh, Whoop Whoop is the one I, I, I quite is it? like. It's a bit harsh, mate. Oh, Whoop Whoop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's, what, that's, that's what me and Ross will be doing tomorrow, hopefully, when she wins. <laughs> um, but, yeah, she's, uh, as Ross said, I think six furlongs is exactly what she needs. She was the first off the bridle over five at Yarmouth last time. And uh, even though she's still a maiden, the form of those maiden she's running have uh, worked out pretty well so yeah whoop whoop at 14 to 1 will uh, will do for me yeah uh, yeah i did think she was interesting she's come from the family of capella sansevero so uh these conditions should be pretty much spot on so yeah uh, gaden and whoop whoop for me Graham, yeah i'm with gaden okay gaden it is and tom well i'm on the old flag of saint george whatever it's called but starlust is obviously a very interesting horse i'm just worried about the draw yeah. installed it might be all right but if you watch that five furlong race, we, that was the last race today, they had no chance, the ones that raced on this side. So I think they'll all go over, and therefore it might not be an issue, but that would be my worry. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, that's, that draw is a bit of a, bit of a red flag for Starlust, but um, yeah, you, are a, uh, you are a patriotic man, Tom, so I can understand. Well, you go with Flag of St. George. Uh, last race on tomorrow's card then, the 520. Let's uh, uh, close it out with a three-year-old handicap over a mile and three furlongs here. Nader King is 7-2. to two. Intricacy is 5-1 to one with balance play. Uh, Mazer Basti is 11-2. True Legend, 15-2. to two. Roaring Legend and Sovereign Spirit, 11s. Loyal Touch, 12s. Uh, bigger prizes the rest, including Dancing in Paris, uh, uh, Alumnus, Quintaro. Uh, and again, another one I thought was a bit big was Rathgar, especially on that second to Royal Rhyme earlier in the season. But uh, Nader King... And intricacy, uh, both been quite well backed, in particular Nader King, um, and uh, yeah, he's he's back on soft ground, which is going to mm. be key. Yeah, uh, stout. Is this the race that he's won a few times, or is it, I, I get mixed up? There's one race that he's won a few times. Oh no, he's not won it a few times. That was it. Poet's Word Poets won Word. this race. Yeah, same I remember. Connections. Yeah, same connections. Poet's Word won this race, of course, before be going on to become a Group One horse uh, later in his career. So, yeah, you can certainly see the case for Nader King, can't you? Um, I, if it had been on the all-weather, I'd have liked Alumnus for, for Johnston, but he's got two runs on turf, and I think he's been beaten outside both times. Um, so I've gone for a horse that's finished behind him, Mazo Basti. Okay. Finished behind Alumnus last time out at Newcastle. Hot favourite that day, Mazo Basti. Well beaten by Alumnus. Funny old track, though, isn't it, Newcastle? Mm. You end up on the wrong side, you get buffeted by the wind. I'm not sure that we saw Mazo Basti at uh, his best there. And previously, it lo looked really quite good when he won on soft ground at Nottingham. Um, so he's drawn stall three, so that'll please Tom. Uh, and he looks to be going forward quickly enough, I think, Mazo Basti. OK, there we go. Uh, Mazo Basti, yeah, it was a funny race. It was a funny race, that Newcastle one. It was a very anti-Newcastle race as uh, alumnus kicked on and they didn't get to the, uh, the front runners. What about you, Tom? I like your Rathgar. Stall one. Thought that form, which you mentioned, was very good. But I'm a, I'm a sucker for a Rafe Becker and a Lope de Vega. So balance play was my fa you know 
I can't get over how good uh, Royal Rhyme was in the first race today. He's by Lope de Vega as well. They just, I don't know, we had the discussion with Paul on the show this morning, and i just a massive fan of him as a sire on all ground types, but especially when there's a bit of giving it. So balance play, stepping up in trip. I think he'll absolutely love it. The downside is full 13, but it's the mile and three race, isn't it? So they sort of go up around the top end, don't they? And then over the hills and far away and, you know, all the, you know, you move, you can't see him from the stand for about half of it. Such a great place, Goodwood. And then uh, balance play, well, hopefully will come in front when we can all see him at the back uh, when they come into the straight. He loves Goodwood, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. Every, every year. I can't believe you've not had the week off, uh, quite frankly. <laughs> But, I tried. I try to get it every year, but the man sitting on your right won't let me off. The man sitting on my right. <laughs> Again, yeah, there you go. I forgot. Yeah, I forgot that Graham holds the uh, the keys to the rotor. Uh, Lewis closes out for tomorrow's card. Yeah, a lot of money for Matteo Basti in this one. Who Rod has mentioned that one's been back from eleven to two um, in, into eleven to two from nine to one. But I think Nader King wins this one. Uh, all his best forms on soft ground, and he was second to King of Steel at Nottingham in a maiden last year on soft ground. So yeah, I think he'll relish the underfoot conditions, and uh, yeah, I think he'll go and win. Lovely stuff. Right, uh, we'll get the naps in a second. But again, do like if you haven't already the uh, the stream. And uh, oh, I've got all sorts of Not promises. Just, just keep it slightly lower than 300. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how that goes. Uh, and uh, we'll get the naps on uh, Friday in just a second. Fabulous or a freaky Friday at Glorious Goodwood. Uh, hopefully, we'll get a few naps in. Starting off with the man to my left, Graham Rodway. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go with uh, uh, Vino Victrix S Quay Casum, whatever it was. Absolutely, in One, the opener. In the opener, 150 at Goodwood, Vino Victrix. Fantastic stuff. Uh, Tom? Takarib Bay for me. Takarib Bay in the Golden like. Mile. The Golden yeah. Jacket in the Golden Mile. Uh, Lewis yeah. Knowles? Nader King in the last for me. Yeah, banker. Okay, lovely stuff. And I will go for Epic Tetris to drop back. You're going to nap that. Wow. I am. Yeah. What a bold shout. Good luck, Ross. Wow. With all the bold shouts or something. Mm. Is that the that's the <laughs> yeah, catch line yeah, somewhere, isn't it. it? Look, there's no point napping eight to thirteen <laughs> shots, is there? Glorious Goodwood. Uh, five days, one eight to one winner. You need one winning nap, don't you? Job done. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks everyone for watching. We'll be back for one more time uh, tomorrow night. Uh, where uh, we'll give you the one, two, three in the Stewards Cup, or at least Tom Siegel will in 30 seconds. Good luck tomorrow.